Good morning, good evening. This is the ninth South South Forum. And today we are in our fifth uh, session. Welcome everybody. And we are honored to invite Hernan Jose Barcas from Venezuela. And today his topic is the communal the communal way of uh, inter-Venezuelan Venezuelan, uh, social, socialism, radical democracy, commun communal economy, and community uh, livelihood. I am Koji Xiong. I come from the Green Ground Ecotech Center. Hernan has been our friends for a long time. In 2019, he came to China for a visit, and we have been in several several places of uh, new rural reconstruction in China. Hernan is the vice minister for, commun for communal economy of the communes and social movements, Ministry of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Also, he is uh, from the Movimiento, uh, Movimiento de Pobladores, which is the uh, uh, people's People's uh, resident, people's uh, cities residents movement. He is also from the Alva movements secretari secretariat, people's economies and social reproduction researcher. He is also the founding member of the Observatorio Venezolano de las Economías Populares. So today, for people who do research on the comparative study, especially in the section of the economies, because Venezuela is. Is, uh, is is an example. Um, he has suffered from the uh, new, new neoliberal um, shock in the last century. And there has been a, a very bad impact on the social economy. But now they have with the left wings uprising, especially in the era of the left turn in Latin America, won the election and become the, 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 the socialist example in the Latin America. And they also, they also expropriate, expropriate and stational, stationalized of the economy to benefit the grassroots of the people of the society. Of course, the the social economy structure of the mon, mono of the mono monastic mono monotistic uh, structure is very hard to change, and also under the section of the America, which also make the Venezuelan economy suffer. So, in this kind of situation, Venezuelan communal movement has has managed to mobilize the grassroots and especially on the section of the um, agricultural economy, trying to be more self-sufficient in the economy. So today our speaker will, will introduce more in the, introduce to us more about the communal way of the Venezuelan socialism. So now let's welcome Hernan to bring to us the today's uh, lecture. Thank you very much, dear brother. Uh, uh, good morning and good evening for everyone. Uh, it's nice to, to be here in the South South Forum for Sustainability in the ninth edition. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and one regards to uh, Kinchi, Lao, and Jade Tsitwe. Uh, so, you know, today we're going to, to talk a little about uh, this special thesis that has been developed by professors Iraida Vargas and Mario Sanoja, a Venezuelan anthropologist. Uh, and also history professors, they have proposed this thesis about how in Venezuela, it has been built uh, a road into socialism uh, from the communal grassroots. Uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is this thesis of the communal way into socialism in Venezuela. 
as I was saying before, uh, Prof. Um, Mario Sanoja and Iraida Vargas, they, they propose to us this idea that in Venezuela, from 500 years ago, with the resistance that starts with the European colon colonization of the continent, which has been a process of systematic extermination of indigenous people, and with the path of the of the of the centuries, it has been maybe as Professor Bandana Shiva told us uh, a very few years, of, a very few days ago in this forum, uh, she talked about the um, systematic extermination of knowledge. Uh, I think that maybe what what we have lived here in Latin America has been a systematic process of extermination of the cultural system, political system, and economical system of indigenous people. So from that point, uh, the indigenous peoples, uh, instead of that systematic extermination, has established process of resistance. And this process of resistance have uh, accumulated uh, some uh, common grounds of these political systems and these economical systems and these cultural systems. For example, uh, Professor uh, Vargas and Sanoja told us about how the Caribe peoples in, in Venezuela uh, uh, stay uh, resisting in the Caracas Valley, which is the current uh, capital of Venezuela. They move from the mountain into the zone of Katia, which is one of the most important uh, uh, grassroots barrios from today, from people, uh, some popular uh, uh, common grounds uh, where they, they, they propose that this system of resistance of the Caribbean peoples have uh, remained till today. With the past of the time, it has been uh, transmitted from, from one community to another. So this community way of life has resisted and have been uh, transforming with the path of time. And for example, they propose that in the 20th century, a lot of the most important process of mobilization, of protest, of, uh, of popular organization, uh, it's a consequence of this process of accumulation of, uh, of indigenous community waste that has been uh, transforming with the path of the times. They also propose that um, then the, with the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution in 1999, with the start of the government of Hugo Chavez, when the process, when the constituent process, the building of a new constitution, and the basis of a new republic, it starts the Bolivarian Revolution, but the Bolivarian Revolution for them is like uh, a mixture because it's both a consequence of this process of community relations that comes from the, from the, from the resistance of indigenous peoples, from the colonization, but also is uh, uh, um, an important force of promotion of this community uh, ways of, of, of life, of make politics, of make economics, of make culture in a general sense. So uh, from, from this point of view, uh, I, I will tell you about a little how we how we can interpret uh, 
this, this, this last 20 years of Bolivarian revolution. Um, so I want to tell you uh, about some key variables of this way, uh, some key elements that's, that constitute this communal way into socialism in Venezuela. Uh, the first one is about uh, the Bolivarian Revolution has uh, took control of the oil income. Uh, as you know, uh, from the, the first half of the 20th century, they start this process of uh, oil exploitation in the whole world. And especially here in Latin America, in Venezuela, is one of the most important uh, 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 process of, of accumulation oil oil sheds of in in the in this region. Uh, currently, Venezuela is one of the main uh, oil reserves in the whole world, um, and as a result, the 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 capitalism in Venezuela, the colonial way of reproduction, has turned into an oil based uh, model. And during the after after in the second half of the 20th century, after a process after dictatorship after a dictatorship, uh, it started a process of so-called democracy, which actually was uh, an elite pact uh, between two uh, parties, two right parties, uh, that. Um, made an agreement with the elites of the United States government. And there starts this process of republic where the arrangement was the, the, uh, a process of dispossession, uh, of extraction of value uh, from the oil, mainly into the global market. So the result was that in the, from the 60s, uh, and on uh, the majority of the of the oil from Venezuela was sold into the United States in low prices, uh, and actually most of the of the oil industry in Venezuela was turned into some kind of subsidy into the economical uh, uh, oil market, international oil market, but. It's something that changed. This is one of the key elements of the of the Bolivarian Revolution because the start process of progressively take control of this industry. Uh, one example of that is that it starts changing the 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 the, the framework of the of the distribution of the cell of the market of the Venezuelan oil. So progressively, you start to sell the oil to other countries like Russia, like China, like the Caribbean, like Cuba. And that was a, a first point of this, of this process of taking control. But also, it starts taking control of the prices of the oil. Uh, and it uh, actually increased the, the internal income of Venezuela. The second key element of this uh, socialism built in Venezuela is the internal redistribution. This, this was, these are um, key elements that are uh, uh, deeply related the one to each other. Uh, this internal the redistribution uh, was like um, going uh, part ways on the one hand, it, it, it sustained the, the process of redistribution into the, the, the traditional sectors of the market, the internal market. Venezuela is one of the, of, the re, of the countries of the region. I think that is not common at all, uh, where the, the internal market was depending on the oil income. Uh, the first, the main uh, enterprises in Venezuela, the main industries, uh, doesn't invest 
in development and maintenance. Uh, this uh, budget becomes from the comes from the from the uh, from the oil income, and that's uh, a, a difference uh, related to the rest of the countries of the of the region. But with mm -hmm. the Bolivarian Revolution, it start a process where this uh, this uh, relation starts to change, and progressively this internal redistribution was uh, redirected into uh, subsidies for, for the rights for the people, like water, like education, like health, but also into, into wages. Uh, for, the, for the salaries, for the, for the work, you start the process of, of, of uh, increasing the value uh, of, the, of the work it was basically because uh, the the um, the oil income was redistributed into these areas. The third key element of this socialism is uh, a maximization of the social spend, the so-called social social spend. As I said before, uh, with this oil income, you start the process to guarantee that education is a universal right for the whole population, but also health as a universal right, and also with the access to water, but also to the access to food, housing, uh, culture, uh, multiple services. With this uh, redistribution model, uh, nearby the 70% of the oil income was uh, dedicated, has been dedicated into social, the so-called social spend. And one of the key elements that I want to mention as a, as a third um, point to, to analyze in this, in this uh, night, in this session, is about how this redistribution, uh, an important part of it, was uh, directed into the people's organization center policies, which means uh, uh, a several of, uh, uh, of public policies that were directed, but that were centered in the people's organization. And that's maybe one of the uh, more distinctive uh, characteristics of the Bolivarian Revolution. Uh, au contraire of more of the, of the process in Latin America, uh, constituent process, maybe like Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela has this uh, characteristic of redistribution into people's organization. Uh, and there's when I want to center in some issues that I think that um, complete this thesis of coming away into socialism proposed by uh, Professor uh, Sanoja and Vargas. Uh, let me explain this. Like for example, in the twenty, in the in the two thousand two and two thousand four start a process of organization of different community committees. Like for example, the urban land committee, community com committees, which, which uh, goal, which main goal was to guarantee the execution of, a, of a national act directed to regularization of the, of the land tenants in the in the popular uh, 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 in the popular uh, areas for example in caracas maybe something like in the in the capital of venezuela maybe something like the 60% of the population live in popular areas in popular barrios which uh, during the second half uh, of the 20th century uh, growed a lot because was the people that came from the from the uh, from the rural areas 
uh, and they came to the city to work for for the capital, maybe building, maybe uh, maybe uh, selling services, uh, maybe working for for some uh, elite families. But the result is that they live in the most uh, precarious areas of the city uh, with no services, with a lot of risk, with a lot of instability, but also with no recognition of the tenants of the land. So in 2004, uh, uh, start this process uh, where it was decreed uh, I'll, um, an act, a law, a national law for regulating the tenants of the land in these uh, popular uh, assessments. And in these areas, uh, the national policy was centered in people's organization because it says, well, we have this law with this, uh, with this main goal, but it requires that the people in these communities start a process of people's assembly to delegate uh, in some spoken persons from community that has the task of organizing the process of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the catastrophe, the whole area, the cadaster of the whole area. They start a process to identify in a map where each family is and establish a, a, a way, a code for each one. It was a process of building also a methodology for this kind of, of, uh, of, 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 of cadaster, but also they start this process of uh, register the history of the origin of this community. So it's, it's quite important to see how this politics uh, was uh, related to community organization and actually uh, uh, allow the, the state to achieve a uh, main goal. Today we have uh, uh, most of the, of, the, of the popular sectors in Caracas are uh, regulated in the tenants uh, manner. And that's a result of this kind of organization. Today you can see a map of the, the cities of Venezuela, and you can clearly see all the communal sectors that uh, 20 years ago uh, wasn't there. Uh, but also you have the example of the, the water community committees, Mesas Técnicas de Agua in Spanish. Uh, it was an organization dedicated to guarantee the access to water which is a right that is guaranteed by the national constitution, uh, but it requires that the community in the, in, the, in the citizens assembly, community assembly, uh, delegates in some of the, of the people of the barrio, the task of uh, diagnose which are the main uh, problems with the, uh, the access to the water, Maybe some of them has to be with the, with the connection to the main networks of distribution of water. Some of them are related to uh, the, the, the diagnosis of the condition of the, of the current networks, uh, the current tubes in the, in, the, in the barrier. As a result, you have a lot of communities organizing this and guaranteeing a lot of access. Uh, in, the, in the first uh, 10 years of, of this uh, politic, uh, the, the access to the water in Venezuela increased from uh, something like 20, 25% of no access at all to water. It reduced into uh, into, into an, an, a level of access superior uh, to, to 50%. Um, that's something that, that actually you, you will see with, with more clarity in the book that we are about to launch in the next session uh, about Venezuelan struggles. But I mean, I, I mentioned these two examples as, a, as, a, as an example 
of these politics for creating community committees, which has the task of guarantee uh, the, 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 legal re the legal regent uh, that you have in constitution and in some laws that actually w the main goal is guarantee some social rights. And like this, you have also some energy communities, also telecommunication committees, also health committees. So maybe the last, the, the first uh, years of Bolivarian Revolution was, were marked by this uh, organization of committees in order to guarantee the, what I call people's organization center policies. Then you have also a process of promotion of different kinds of social movements. Uh, like for example, with the peasant, uh, it start a lot of process of organization of different movements, uh, which main goal was guarantee uh, the, the struggle against latifundism, against uh, um, the control of land by the elites, uh, so it starts a process of, of land reform in order to, to uh, reverse this relation to the land. Uh, then there you have a lot of different uh, platforms of peasants that start a process of uh, regaining of, in Venezuela, they call it uh, regaining or rescue, uh, um, no, no use land. Uh, or a lot of lands in, in the hands of, 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 of Latifundio. But also you have these kind of movements in, in the cities. For example, I'm part of a Pobladores movement, which is uh, like the equivalent to the, to, the, to the peasants movement in the rural areas, but in the cities which is uh, a lot of urban platforms that fight against uh, urban speculation, immobiliary speculation. Uh, they fight against evictions. They fight for, in order to guarantee uh, the regaining of land for the families that are living in risk uh, in some uh, dangerous areas. And there is that a process of, of actually not only guarantee the tenants of the land, but also the right to transform the conditions of, of living, but also to promote uh, the livelihood conditions of the community's grassroots. In these two examples that I mentioned before, like in the communities, the committees, but also the social movements, you can see this, um, this thread of the, of the of the this this uh, this this fabric of the community relations that has been uh, uh, resisting during a lot during all the 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 colonized history of our country, but they remain in there. There are a lot of fabric uh, centered in solidarity, in reciprocity, in possibilities of guaranteed reproduction of life. Uh, from the collective cooperation. And then there was a point, an important point in the, in the Venezuelan history, where the start a process of uh, articulate all this diversity in organizations. Uh, maybe in 2006, a start a process of discussion about the necessity to integrate all these committees and all these social movements in a common ground and they give a, a, a next step into self-governance, self-management and social control. So then start the process of organization of the consejos comunales, uh, communal councils, which are, a which are, which is, a, uh, is actually the, the first cell of governance in the, in the ground. Uh, the, the, the National Act for Communal Councils uh, define them as the cell of self-governance in the territory, and they define uh, a very uh, important issue, uh, which is that the Communal Council 
is uh, his first, his most important uh, uh, instance of the session is the, the community assembly, which means that all citizens of the territory must reunite and discuss the most important matters and take decisions. And that's the, 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 the decision-making instance of the communal council, which after this decision delegates the decision in some instance of organization. Uh, the communal council has spoken persons, but we have the mandate of the, of the, the, the collective uh, mandate of the, of the of most of community. And with that process start a moment where the communal council was the center of the redistribution of a lot of budgets. In the last 10 years, a lot of, of projects, community projects dedicated to access to health, access to water, uh, uh, revitalization, revitalization of the infrastructure, housing, uh, the access to services has been uh, uh, managed by the communal councils. So there in, in 2008, 2009, uh, Hugo Chavez start a process of discussion about the necessity to go back to this uh, old proposal from a different process of revo revolutionary process in the world. Uh, and he spoke about the necessity to, to establish communes. Communes as, a, as an instance of articulation of different communal councils. So, which means that maybe in one uh, 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 rural area, you can uh, assembly 10 or eight or six or four communal councils into a commune. And the commune, it's the, the first cell of self-governance, self-management and social control. That's quite important because it's our process and how this has to be uh, the expression of the model of socialism in the territory. Chavez spoke about the necessity to establish a new relations, a new pattern of relations in the social issue, in the economical issue, in the political issue, in the cultural issue, but also in the, in the ways of organization of the territory. Uh, so, the community started the process of discussion as well, of all these ways of, of transformation. And I think that, of course, these were not, this has been in the last years, a process um, uh, with a lot of contradictions, with a lot of difficulties, with a lot of, of, of weakness, but also with a lot of, of potentialities. As, as Hama mentioned before, uh, actually Kinchi and Jare and, uh, and Sishan himself and, uh, and Xiaohe, also Xiaohe, were had the opportunity to be here in Venezuela and know some of these communes with the different contradictions, but also with the different potencies, the, the potentialities that they have, the forces that they have accumulated. Uh, well, of this, all these uh, expressions, I wanna, um, I think that are a uh, representation of what I mentioned before as this way of building socialism from a communal way. Because in the different presentations, you can call it community, community, co community you can call it a communal council, you can call it social movement, you can call it a commune, but what they have in common is that they are uh, different tools that um, are related to common issues, which is the necessity of building, uh, rebuilding, regenerating a community way of life, which is not centered in the colonized uh, ways of, of, of reproduction of life, 
they are not centering the same wave of property. They are not centering the same wave of politics. They are not centering the same ways of economy. Like for example, you can see that right now, uh, the hegemony, the hegemony in politics from the Western is centered in the idea of the representation. Uh, you have these governments, uh, so-called democratics, democratic uh, and free governments that are centered actually in a pact of elites between two parties, uh, both right parties, by the way, in most of the countries in Latin America and in the world. But these communal experiences here in Venezuela are centered in a different uh, kind of power. Uh, we talk here about the radical democracy, uh, a, a democracy centered in the participation and the protagonism of most of the people. So as I mentioned before, in a commune, the decisions have to be made by consensus in the community, by discussion in the community. And the community uh, reunites and discuss and take decisions. And of course, that is not perfect. That has a lot of uh, difficulties, but it's uh, a process um, diametrical uh, opposed to this Western democracy, which is centered in the Pact of Elites. You can also have here in Venezuela uh, a process of discussion about a new way of economies. At this moment, uh, I have a, a, a responsibility in the policy making of the state related especially to this communal economy. And most of the discussions that we are having now in different rounds where you have different kind of organizations, here in Venezuela you have uh, what we call social uh, social property enterprises, empresas de propiedad social, which are centered in uh, different uh, production relations. Uh, as for example, in the last time we have been discussing that communal economy has to answer to three principles. The first one is the principle of reproduction of life. Uh, against the economy which is centered in reproduction of capital. Communal economy has to reproduce life. And actually, because right now, what we are living, as this, uh, as this uh, South South Forum has mentioned, is a process of collapse of the modern civilization. And this collapse is putting in risk the life, the continuity of life in the planet all the ways of life. And that's the reason that, because we are discussing that communal economy has to be centered in reestablished life, conditions for life. The second principle for communal economy that we are discussing now is that communal economy has to be centered in the people's power, has to be centered in the assembly's power, has to be centered in the consensus most of the people discussing what they want for future, most of the people discussing and deliberating and, uh, and, and going into, into an agreement, a collective agreement. And that marks a way of make politics because then the spoken persons, the, the people from politics are not merely representatives. They don't make decisions, they have to follow they have to obey the collective decision. And that's a, a different way of thinking the politics. So the economical decisions have to obey to the uh, collective uh, decision. And then the third principle that we are discussing for communal economy is about to develop uh, different ways of organizing organizing the economy, organizing the ways of manage the economies. So what we are discussing is that uh, the Western civilization has uh, uh, established this idea of the free market economy where you have private sector and you have the public sector 
represented by the state. Well, right now we are discussing that the communal uh, is a, a different sector. It's not private, it's not a state, it's the communal way. Not necessarily against uh, a state, maybe against private, but actually can be related to the, to the private market, but it has uh, different ways of organization and different ways of manage. Because right now, uh, at this point, we have a crisis of the political representation. You can see that, and, the, and also the political ways of manage. You can see how they are trying to establish this so-called fourth industrial revolution, which is not industrial at all, but it, like a way of refreshing the relation between the state and the market and the, in order to prevail the capitalist system. So we think that we need to fight for these different ways of organization from below in the economy sector. Uh, well, the thing is then that we are discussing how we can uh, uh, refresh these communal uh, economies, these popular economies, that when we see the last, the last seven years, eight years in Venezuela, we have been under a lot of sanctions from the United States. Uh, there's a process of, of global crisis where the United States has the necessity to take control, uh, political and economical control of Venezuela, stop the path of this socialism that we have been building. And we start a process of crisis uh, related to these sanctions, to this blockade that we're living now. And it has, uh, it has derivated into a process of resistance. The last eight years in Venezuela has been a process of deep resistance from the people in order to guarantee the reproduction of life. So on the one hand, you have uh, a lot of reconfigurations uh, in, the, in the midst of the crisis that has been centered in the, in the free market ideas, in, in a reposition, in a repositioning the, the, the free market ideas, but also you have a process of reorganization and reaccumulation of, of force of power in the communal and popular economies. Uh, maybe I think that it's important to say as, a, as, a, as some final uh, remarks, that what you have in the last years is a, a process that do, I, I think that maybe you remember that I told you that some key elements are the for the Bolivarian revolution and his way to socialism has been taking control of the oil income, uh, the internal distribution of this uh, income, the maximal social span, and the people's organization uh, for, for the development of politics. Well, let me say that the, that the consequence of the blockade has been basically to uh, prom uh, promote a collapse of this, of this uh, model of Bolivarian revolution. Because as you can see, it's all centered in the possibility to, to, of taking control of the oil income but the sanctions have been orientated, directed to reduce or even impoverish the oil income. As a result, in 2000, if you can see the official uh, public figures, you can see uh, that in 2015, Venezuela has an oil income uh, which was uh, approximately in fifty billion dollars. Fifty billion dollars. Uh, but then, in two thousand twenty, the oil income of Venezuela was about seven hundred millions. Seven hundred millions. So it means from 50, uh, 50 billions to 700 millions, which is something like 1% of what they had, of what we have 
as an oil income uh, some years ago. And that's, a, that's a mainly a result of the sanctions of the what we call a blockade. And I mentioned that because that started a process of crisis into, the, into our system because with uh, this, this, uh, this collapse of the oil income, this absolute decrease of the oil income, the possibilities of internal redistribution are really, really decrease also. And of course, the possibility of this redistribution to guarantee the maximum social spend has uh, uh, have collapsed as well. And of course, the possibility to guarantee that this social spend goes to the to the politics center in the people's organization as well. So this period of crisis has actually put in an important test the, the community organization. As maybe you can know, in the last time, uh, a lot of, uh, after a difficult process of resistance in the last years, and maybe a lot of, of situations of, of uh, struggle from the government, the Bolivarian government, from the Bolivarian people, from all the sectors in our society, we have uh, been able to guarantee resistance and not, uh, and not intervention in our country. The last year we have had a uh, risk of, of intervention, of, of assassination of the president. We have had under a very important economic war. We have had a risk of, of, of uh, intervention of some uh, party, paramilitary uh, groups. So uh, we have been able to resist and to control and to contain these risks. And at this point, this year, 2022, there are a lot of uh, indicatives that maybe we can start a process of stabilization and economical growth. So this is a moment where we think that it's quite important and that's mm, maybe part of the task that I'm assuming now. It's a quite critical moment to guarantee the strengthening of people's organization that has resisted this time. And we have to recognize this process of resistance, especially in communal economies and radical democracy and livelihood experiences, but also we need to promote them and to help them. We need to support them. I think that what we are doing now is to establish the necessity of a transfer means for production and for, and for reproduction of life, but also the necessity to uh, connect in networks, these whole experiences that we have right now. Some of them are connected, but we need to promote the, pro the process of connection and building some communal circuits, so communal uh, circuits of economy, of a different economy, which uh, answers to different principles, as I mentioned you before. I wanna, I wanna end this, this, uh, this presentation uh, just, um, mentioning some challenges that, that I think that we have right now. Uh, during this year, the, uh, the last year, actually, I, I, I shared uh, an article which was related to the, uh, the current challenges of the constituents process that we had in Latin America. As you may know, at the beginning of the 21st century, we had a process, constituent process in Bolivia, in Ecuador, and also in Venezuela. But also in the last years, they have been talking in different countries about the necessity to promote constituent process. Like for example, in Colombia, like for example, in Brazil, like for example, in Chile that they have right now a discussion about a new constitution but also in Peru, they talk about this necessity. All these discussions were 
traversed by a lot of crisis because it's a moment of collapse. But uh, the, the main point here is that I, uh, that I wanna share some of the challenges that I think that we have right now in Venezuela, but also in the, in the region. That could be something for the discussion for, for tomorrow panel. But I wanna mention regarded to, to the Venezuelan situation. I think that one of the main challenges that we have right now is to promote a process of, uh, of economical constituents, a, an economical transformation, which is uh, about to promote this communal economy, which is centered in life. And the reason is basically because in the last years, we have led a process of, of crisis in Venezuela, but also an important process is crisis, which the, the, where the countries with more development condi conditions, uh, their main goal wasn't, uh, wasn't save lives, wasn't guarantee the life of the people. On the contrary, uh, the, the balance of the, of the countries of the, of the Western, the North, uh, the North countries, they actually uh, start a process of more poor people. A lot of people die, a lot of people sick, a lot of people without job. And, and on the other hand, you have the elites uh, more segregated, uh, uh, many few rich people with a lot of, with more, more and more money. As you can see, they increase the accumulation of capital and the life uh, decrease and the life conditions and also the inequality grows and also the unemployment grows. So the communal, the necessity to build an, an, a pattern of economy which is centered in life is a necessity for Venezuela right now. We are, as I mentioned before, the, the the model of Bolivarian Revolution was centered in oil income. And if the US sanction destroyed the oil income, we are in the necessity to build a new way of economy of sustainability for the, our country. And it has to be centered in life. The second challenge that we need, we, that I think we have at this moment is centered in a power, in a power constituent, in a political constituent which is centered in promote a process of radical democracy. The way of the communal, of the communal experiences has to be centered specifically in these ways of taking decisions from below, in these people's assembly power, in this process of made consensus, in most of the people participating and discussing what they need and they have, what they have to do. And it has to be a reference right now because we are living a process of political crisis. Uh, and, I know, and I'm not just talking about Venezuela. We have seen in the last, in the last months how in, in Peru, they have elected uh, a president that was talking about land reform, that was talking about constituent, that was talking about the necessities of the poor people and to govern for poor people. And you see how the elites have made impossible the governance for this president. So right now we think that the answer to that is to build a new way of politics, because if we depend on the politics from elites, we are basically, <laughs> we're in problem, we're in trouble. And the last challenge that I wanna mention is about the livelihood constituent necessity. We need to think in a different way of life. The example of Venezuela has been important because the last years of resistance has forced most of the people in change the livelihood uh, habitus. Uh, like for example, a lot of farmers have to be in necessity to uh, reproduce their own seeds and not depend of the, of the market the free market uh, seats, uh, which are actually controlled by the, by, the, by the transnational powers. But also a lot of people in the, in the cities has started to uh, change 
their patterns of consumption, eating more uh, vegetables and eating more uh, uh, fruits and different uh, uh, food that sometimes ago we do, we don't have as a as a as a question that as a part of our uh, livelihood habitus. And we can have a sovereign process if we don't have a different kind of consumption. But also we need to change the, our livelihood if, from an individual way of life into a community way of life, into collective ways of uh, sustainability, because actually that's, that has been one of the key elements of resistance during these years of crisis here in Venezuela. So, what I try to mention is this for this closure is that I think that we have some common challenges here in Venezuela, but I kind of think that are common challenges also for Latin America, but also for the global South. And that's some elements that could be important for this South South Ninth South South Forum. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ednan. Thank you for your wonderful sharing and presentation. He, he has uh, summarized a few points on how America, how Venezuela organized the communal communal way and also the communal movement from the from the bottom as the way of uh, Venezuela into socialism. I think he has uh, concluded very well, and also he told us. Uh, the current situation of the communal, communal, uh, the communal movement, the problems, the challenges, and the practice. So he has given us a very good reference and inspirations. Now, now we would invite Rosie Zuniga from from uh, Mexico. To give us a comment, he is a she is a very famous, uh, popular feminist educator and social 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 sociologist member of the strategic coordination team of the Council of Popular Education of Latin America and the Caribbean, and she is also of the International Council of the World Social Forum member of the facilitating group of the World Social Forum in Mexico and of the collective of the festival of the uh, for the dignity of the peoples. So welcome, Rosie. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Thank you so much for the invitation and congratulations for this ninth South, South Forum in which we have seen wonderful sessions and, and discussions on this collapse that we are undergoing. So thank you so much, Arnan, for this excellent uh, session on what is happening in Venezuela and the way in which the people of Venezuela has uh, overcome all these challenges. I hope I am not uh, speaking so fast so that the translation uh, can go well. I would like to uh, say a couple of things and underscore some of the things that uh, Hernan told us, because as uh, Hernan has already said, I cannot uh, not say uh, what I know about popular education. On the one hand, uh, this uh, about the systematic extermination of knowledge which someone some people call epistem epistemological murder of our peoples has to do with this capitalist logics of uh, making uh, popular knowledge and wisdom disappear and i think this is very fundamental something to to uh, recall Something else that I found very interesting, which has to do with how we can uh, go towards uh, energy sovereignty, but not only saying just uh, uh, use our oil model, but actually to reinvent these models to, to have a model that goes in the service of life and the peoples and the grassroots. 
what he said about contradictions that we live through in this process is, and when Kinchi and Jade went to Venezuela to visit, they saw these contradictions and it's key in all political and transformative processes. We have to recognize that processes, processes um, are in constant flow. This is what Paulo Freire usually said. Life is not given to us, it's, it's ongoing. So we have to recognize that we are multiple, that we are complex and contradictory ourselves. So it's important to understand and to recognize those contradictions to build what we actually want to achieve. And there are some key things in popular education, such as reconstructing, rebuilding, recreating, participating and engaging in dialogue. So I think that is fundamental as well. Something else that is very much present in feminist spaces and proposals has to do with taking care of life and life reproduction among all of us. That, of course, is key in our processes and in all throughout this years of struggle at the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, there are many lessons as Hernan very well points out. How can we uh, reorganize life or change consumption patterns? How can we build a new way of doing politics and how do we consume differently? So in this process of reconstructing life, we have to rethink ourselves, rethink ourselves within society and how we can have a popular education council or committee all throughout Latin America to, to build autonomous societies, uh, sovereign societies. We need to have this transformative educational processes to, to achieve that. Paulo Freire used to say that if education is not freeing, uh, the, the dream of the people will become the dream of the oppressors. So it's important to, to recognize these contradictions. So in light of what Hernan told us about how they are rethinking and recreating and re building uh, a government or life or communities, Paulo Freire usually uh, also inspired many of our struggles. So I wanted to thank uh, all of you. Jade told us that there, there are many Chinese people in the audience, so the, the Chinese audience is quite marvelous. I don't know if you know Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire was a popular educator who was born in the Pernambuco state in Brazil. That state is in the northeast part. This is a uh, dry area, arid area, where there are many injustices, as in many of our peoples, not only in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also in other parts of the world, such as India or China or other countries in the east. Uh, global South. This is something that we have picked up from other sessions in this South-South forum. So Freire was a lawyer who decided to stop practicing law to become a teacher. And he is recognized, uh, re renowned all around the world for his method. And what was this method about? Well, this has to do with what Arnan was telling us before. How do we learn to read the world? How do we learn to, to read the world in a critical way? It's not only about reading words, but in this process of, of learning, we have to learn about the world to transform it. And part of this method uh, sometimes those elements are reproduced mechanically, but are forgotten. But actually, the method implied a process of research, of recognizing reality, of acknowledging the elements that gave meaning to the life of the peoples, and not only just mere words. And that is where we get what we call the generating word. 
which allows us to uh, recognize objects. For example, uh, I will say a word in Portuguese that was key. The, the word is tijolo. Tijolo means brick. I don't know how you say this in Chinese, but brick, the word brick, or, or the brick itself is um, sand and cement that has been processed in order to build a house. So the word was separated in order to understand uh, how it was built, but actually to understand its history, why the word was constituted this way and what for. So it's important to recognize that we have to learn how to read the world in order to transform it. So this method is inserted in a context. All popular economy processes are born from a process of reading reality. We have to locate ourselves in a context, in a place where we see a series of relationships, social, economic, and political relationships. And it's important to understand them, not only academically, but actually uh, in what has to do with our real life. So it is necessary to learn to read the world, to organize ourselves and to change reality. So in this process of uh, recognizing ourselves as subjects of our own history. So if we understand that life is ongoing, we have a role to play to transform that reality. It's key to, to have political formation and training so we can know where we are, what's our position in the face of reality. So to be aware of that is also liberating as a process. We have to have a clear understanding of where we are standing if we're from the side of the oppressor or, or the side of the oppressed in order to change that reality so something that Freire recognizes and that happens in many of our societies for example a couple of years ago and i'm sure that the pandemic made this worse is that there is a uh, lots of um despair. Freire uh, thought that one of the key words was hope and dialogue. So I have to tell you that Freire had to live through uh, persecution due to his own method, the method that he invented. Why? Because people not only learn to read, words but actually learned to read the world so they started recognizing in injustices in 1964 where the coup d'etat happened in brazil freire was persecuted because the method he used opened the minds of people so people could have a critical view of what happened in reality freire was accused he was even put in jail, then he was released, and he had to leave Brazil. And in that trip, he went to different parts of the world. He went to Chile, then he went to Bolivia, then he went to Geneva, Switzerland, France. He, he traveled all over the world. And that allowed him to open, to open his mind as well. He was living uh, oppression and persecution, but he never lost hope. He was a man that had grown up in, in grassroots communities, that is uh, spaces where there were uh, great influence of theology. Theology, as you have, as you know, in Latin America, we have lived through a strong um, processes of domination, the governments of all North uh, countries, France, England, 
Spain, Portugal have all exerted all this dominance. This is why we have a great variety of of languages as well. And this makes us uh, be divided. Many people in Latin America don't understand Portuguese, for example, or there are territories in the Caribbean when where people speak French or Creole or Spanish. And then within our own countries, there are different uh, languages. I'm sure in your country, this happens as well. So how can we build dialogue and in this process, how can we understand how each of our territories read the world? Freire also said that before being persecuted and leaving Brazil in exile, he was able to uh, teach 300 peasants to read and write in 45 days. And his method was useful but there was a political issue in brazil all people that knew how to write and, and read had the right to vote they had the right to decide on which were going to be their representatives in the government and he was about to to teach millions of peasants so for the oligarchy in brazil this was a risk because millions of people that had not had the possibility to choose who were going to be their authorities were going to have that right. So that was one of the great risks of having Paul Freire and of implementing his, his method. Many of the peoples that, that they used to implement that method of reading the world in order to transform it had to leave their country. This is because they were persecuted, many women, many men fled to different territories. They fled to Chile, then they had to leave Chile because it was a coup d'etat there, and there were a series of coup d'etat in Latin America, which meant it was difficult to travel around the world. And it's not about only uh, building knowledge uh, and but it's to build that knowledge in order to then to review our practices and our dreams and our practices related to our dreams what i do in relation to what i say and identify what that i what what i'm saying and what i'm doing is consistent so we have a series of contradictions but we do not recognize them if we are not analyze them it's difficult to transform them so it's important to recognize in this process that there are practices that must transform operation relationships and we should move towards new practices what does this mean that the education and the education training process has to be in a specified context because it's not the same what we're going to do in a specific country in america in latin america in africa or in china and we have to respect each of those processes for said something that was really important. We have to respect fears. That meant also respecting the dynamics, the historic dynamics of each of the society, of each of the subjects. But he also said we have to um, question those fears because if we do not question them, if we do not review them uh, on what we are doing right or what is what we, we're doing wrong, then we're going to keep on making the same mistakes repeatedly. So we have to stop and we have to say, okay, let's review what we are doing in order to transform. And he also said, we all know something and we all ignore you. We, we all ignore something. Nobody is educated on his own. We are educated together in uh, for uh, collective construction. And he was really consistent in his way of building knowledge and on uh, what he was doing by reflecting. He called many of his books spoken books. This means he didn't 
seat to write a book. I mean, there were some of them uh, that were written, but some of them were kind of a dialogue. And some of the books he wrote from the 80s were spoken books. And what this is mean? These were books that were uh, that had a series of questions and that dialogued with people from different territories in uh, Chile, Africa, and they were speaking about different topics. So they had some kind of organization. It's not that they spoke about what they uh, wanted, and they had a construction as to several important topics education and emancipation, educational processes, commitment, hopelessness, these kinds of topics. I have a book here that is called uh, Pedagogy of Commitment that is coordinated by Nita Freire, his, uh, Rita Freire, his uh, widower. Um, there are talks of Freire with organizations, with movements, with students in order to think and rethink how to uh, develop strategies to transform the injustices in the territories. Right part of his transformation process when he became an educator was to re recognize the different injustices suffered by peasants, by workers in his territory in Pernambuco because he was a lawyer and many people came to him and told him about the concerns they had, the abuses of the people that hired him. And he said, okay, well, we have to find a way to transform, to change this. So for him, it was activism was really important and solidarity was also very important. He said education is politics. So if we are starting to see once more in order to recognize reality, we cannot stay in the same position. We cannot freeze. We have to do something because if we do not do do not do anything we are being inconsistent with our standing so popular education is really necessary that is was what Freire taught us so this is a revolutionary proposal he was in Cuba he was in Angola he was in Nicaragua and he uh, he was born in the council and he's our first president in 1982 we are going to be 40 years as a movement so he clearly stated we cannot uh, be halfway we have to have a critical reading of what is happening and we need to take a stance and do something and actually act so these current moment we are living through it requires that so we need popular education not to be separated from society and we need to do what is necessary to transform reality and what we are non shared has to do with this pablo paulus ferris legacy and i'm good i'm going to stop here to continue with the dialogue that uh, ernan's part thank you Thank you. Thank you, Rosie Zunika. So she especially emphasized on the importance of the popular education, especially when we are trying to build the autonomous of the people to from the in the position of the grassroots in the from the bottom to recognize the world, to know the world, because from here we can move on to our transformation. So now we are going to invite another uh, another comment from the uh, from Debbie Barkin, who is from the um, from the University of Mexico, the Autonomous Metropolitan University of Mexico. Uh, David, would you like to say something? Thank you very much. I'd like to return to uh, Hernan Vargas's. Uh, presentation and emphasize something that I think is very important in this uh, South-South Forum. 
And that is, in spite of an extraordinary campaign against Venezuela by the United States, and frankly, the very unfortunate decision of the new Chilean president to uh, continue to, con to accept the decision or, or the rather stupid characterization uh, of Venezuela as a dictatorship, Hernan has brilliantly shown the historical roots for the present efforts to extend and deepen communal activities and in an atmosphere of extraordinary, really extraordinary hardships has managed, the country has managed to mobilize uh, its resources and to hold, to take advantage of the extraordinary heritage of Hugo Chavez in building a new culture, building a new environment in which the Venezuelan people have a chance to attempt to overcome the extraordinary, extraordinary uh, political onslaught against the country. There are the description and the discussion that Hernan Vargas has offered us during his uh, very, very clear presentation. And in this sense, Hernan, I congratulate you uh, very, very much for the clarity with which you made your presentation. Uh, but for the audience, and especially for the audience in China, I think it is very important to understand how significant it is that in the current geopolitical situation, Venezuela is managing to move ahead, consolidate the communes, and to deepen the cooperative spirit among the productive and residential areas, which are the communes that Hernan talked about. I think that we have to understand that this is not a small achievement. This is an extraordinarily important achievement. Uh, and it has to go with the kind of solidarity that Venezuela is finding uh, elsewhere in the world. We can look forward, I hope, and I'm sure Hernan thinks so also, we can look forward to a change in the relationship with his neighboring country in Colombia, uh, and therefore a reduction in the, in the aggression of the Colombian state against Venezuelan uh, people and Venezuelan enterprises. In a similar way, I hope as, uh, as is anticipated, we hope that uh, the change in the political uh, environment in Brazil will also make things a little easier for uh, for Venezuela and allow it to deepen the kinds of communal efforts which it has been pursuing over the past few years. I, I don't think that I can emphasize sufficiently the importance of the uh, communalization of many productive efforts 
of, of many productive enterprises, the deepening of the efforts to improve housing by collective local operations and the recognition of a very important element that has not been given sufficient attention in the past, and that is the attention to internal production of food. So I don't think that I uh, have much more to say to Hernan than what he has contributed to us over the past uh, hour and a half or so of this conversation. But I would like to make uh, one additional comment about Rosita. I think that that's the way you, uh, Jade called her with her uh, name, Rosa Elvia, Elva Suniga, um, because uh, her emphasis and her contribution on popular education and Paulo Freire's history was very important. Here in Mexico, when Paulo Freire came after he was, was uh, in essence exiled from Brazil in the 1960s, I had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with him uh, in the uh, seminars that Ivan Illich uh, created uh, as part of an early book that Ivan wrote called Deschooling Society. And I would, I can't emphasize enough, uh, Rosita, if you will allow me the familiarity. Um, the I can't emphasize enough the importance of the book that we used as a textbook in the creation of our university here in Mexico. I'm at the Metropolitan Autonomous University, um, and his book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, La Pedagogía del Oprimido, is an extraordinary attack against formal educational systems that make, in many cases, make students, make students want, uh, are, make students fail in spite of their extraordinary creati creativity and their um, energy. But let me go back and connect uh, Paulo Freire to what Hernan was saying, because what is going on with the communal efforts that Hernan was emphasizing in Venezuela is a perfect example of the application of the Freirean approach to the notion that we have to depend upon our own energies to liberate ourselves and to grow and to not grow as individuals, but grow as collectivities, grow in communes, grow in community, and understand that we cannot limit ourselves to the extraordinary tyranny of the market that is so destroying our uh, very essence and our ability to move forward. So I congratulate you, Rosita, uh, for bringing this up. And I want to emphasize that the way in Hernan has contributed to our understanding of the importance of the communes there is very much reminiscent, is very much a signal of what we are doing today in Mexico with a, a philosophical approach, which is called comunalidad, which is very, very important in the indigenous populations in Oaxaca today, and which, which I have the fortune to contribute to. And when 
when Hernan talks about the communes in Venezuela, I can't help but think about the heritage that he spoke about in the beginning of his talk of the understanding that Hugo Chavez had about having to move in this kind of original uh, direction. So Hernan, I want to congratulate you. If I could, I would give you an abrazo muy fuerte, fraternal. Pero aquí estoy en México. We're too far away. Uh, so I can't do that. But I would like to give that to you. Uh, I'm so glad to see the beautiful smile on your face. And to our Chinese audience, I think I want you to understand how important the smile on Hernan's face is because it represents the connection between what is happening in Venezuela today and what people all over the Americas, and I hope all over China, all over the world, are doing to deepen to deepen really the notion that we have to depend upon building community and making community the basis for constructing alternative economies to face the crises that the global economy is uh, attacking us with. So I thank you very, very much, Hernan, for your beautiful presentation, Rosita, it was very, very appropriate to relate that to Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, you didn't mention in your talk um, the, the importance of Illich's de-schooling society uh, for uh, that work, but I'm sure that it's part of your own uh, daily practice and for our audience and to especially to Kinchi Lao, to Jade, um, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to, to make these very brief comments. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, David th Barkin. Thank you for your comments. Yes. In the in the era of Mao Zedong, we do also have the movement of co communes, but just like in Venezuela, we were like uh, we were like called as a dictatorship, just like us in Venezuela. But it was a great process because for China, it was it was the best for our our autonomous um, autonomous uh, uh, sovereignty sovereignty. So I would like to make some comments to uh, come up with a question because with, along with uh, Lao King, Professor Lao Qin Chi, Jade and uh, Yan Xiaohui, we were in, we were visiting Venezuela in a, a few years ago and I was inspired very, in, in a great way, because, especially Ernan's presentation also made me feel that in lots of ways, China and Venezuela share some share in comments and we can do a comparative study. Just like what I mentioned earlier that in the early era, in the early at the early beginning of uh, after China gained its in the independence, China was uh, making great contribution to build a left wing and autonomous so sovereignty. Also encountered similar problems, challenges as Venezuela. First, just like Ernan mentioned, why Venezuela's socialism socialism way it needs to it needs to focus on the on the on the um on the community communities building after the revolution china was encountered an old an old uh, uh, an old institution 
and China was trying to reform it. China has also encountered similar problem. The old system was work was in service for the capitalism. You could not just you could not just like turn it around to 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 be in service for the people. So in Venezuela, they started this uh, 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 people's sovereignty to try to reform the system and the Bolivia, Bolivia, uh, Bolivar uh, revolution, trying to reform it. And in China, we also have lots of movements on that direction. And the second point, when it comes to the commune movement, we could see that it has contributed in a lot in the peasant economy, the local community economy. This is a very important issue because the a new a new system a new economic system also always encounter a very severe uh, environment from the especially America and also it also has to has to face the situation when the capital flights would leave impact on the um, economic production in order to stabilize the system you have to organize you have to mobilize the peasants the farmers to rebuild the the uh the rural area so that to guarantee the basic the basic supply of uh, daily daily uses so i think this is a very important issue for china in the begin in the early era of the uh of the uh, of the state we also encounter very serious inflation just like what Venezuela uh, experienced in the 2000 and 2017 when it was facing the American sanction and has to also went through a very, very serious inflation. So China organized the peasants, the peasants community, the rural area to encounter the problem of the uh, inflation. So I think this is also this is also my question to have none that you mentioned the communal um, communal production. You mentioned that you focus on the solidarity between the commune among the communes, which centered on life. Does this already have an effect on eliminating the high inflation rate in Venezuela? So that's the question I would like to pose. So first of all, we would like to invite Aaron to respond to our discussions. And then after that, we will pose the questions from our Chinese audiences. The floor is yours, Hernan. Thank you very much, Thank you to Rosie and David. You know, um, I want to just comment that there are a lot of issues quite important. I really, really thank the comments from our comrades here, especially Rossi, nice to see you. And, and from David, nice to meet you. Uh, you know, I think that maybe <clears throat> with the issue of the popular education, I have to say that actually the process in Venezuela has been a process of a political and popular education from mobilization the struggle for life has been, I think, the most important process of political education, of popular education. I think it has forced us to deconstruct some learning and to access to some new learning. But also, I, I think it's important to mention different things because on the one hand, uh, I, I really agree with this idea. If, if we don't, if we don't build a new dream for future, we will actually reproduce uh, the present that the oppressors has defined for us. And I think that's something uh, to reflect a lot about. Uh, for example, I, I think in the in two in two levels in one level in venezuela for example a lot of community uh, community councils um, fight for uh, repair the infrastructure of the school 
in order that their children could have education. But not all the time, and that's the challenge that we have, we reflect about the kind of education that our children are receiving in those schools. Because a lot of times it happens that in the school, they teach our children to think like the West. They think that maybe, uh, maybe they have to live to the capital of the country and even for another country because they don't believe in to stay there. And I think that's also actually a, a very important uh, reflection in discussion with, the, with our comrades from China because they are making this effort to promote this culture of rural revitalization. And they, I, I, I visit China and I've seen the way that uh, our friends here, Kimchi and Jade and Xixian and Xiaohe, they are promoting this process of, of, of students and university uh, professionals that goes to the, to the country, to the rural side. They are going back. They are not thinking in going another place. They are going back to the rural. So that's something that we need to uh, reflect more about the kind of education. We need a decolonizing uh, education because uh, instead of that, we will reproduce that pattern that we are trying to struggle against. Then the other comment that I, that I wanna make is that actually here in Venezuela, we have been, um, this process of community organization have led to think in different uh, methods to build uh, knowledge. Uh, we have something here that we call analysis colectivo de la práctica, which is something like a collective analysis of the practice which is something that we have been building from different popular education uh, masters that we have in here from different places, actually. A lot of them came from Brazil, another from Peru, another from Chile, uh, and of course, a lot of from here. And we have discussed about they have been building this uh, methodology in order to, to think how we can read the reality in order to transform it but from the collective practice analysis. And that's a quite important uh, issue to, to maybe to exchange in another time uh, uh, more deeply. Then I, I actually, I also wanna, wanna say regarding to the, to, the, uh, to the issue of the popular education as well, that we need to start uh, uh, reconnecting with the making of life because the education directors, the hegemonical education, did it lead us to, the, to make money, learn how to make money. And we need to learn how to make life. For example, here in Venezuela, uh, we have been disconnected and we need to reconnect with building houses, with growing uh, our own food, with, uh, uh, with taking care uh, and improving health for, for our people. We need to reconnect with all the things that we need for life. And in that sense, I wanna say that here in the communes, as I am pretty sure that happens in the rest of the, of the world, in the global south at least, most of the people that guarantee the organization and the collective process are women. And we are in a process to discuss what, did, what does it mean? We have been uh, in Bolivarian revolution, it's quite clear and we have been uh, recognizing the role of the woman in the building of revolution. And that's a good step, but we also have a lot of, uh, of depth in order to advance in the recognition of the the, 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 the implications, the implication of that. For example, 
right now in 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 our country most of the value that is generated for life and for capital is generated is generated from women from women that makes on the one hand guarantee the growth of the children children that will fill the life of our country but also children that we will work for capital so they are guaranteeing the reproduction of of the of the labor force for the capital but also that woman probably has in their house a a, a sewing machine and she's uh, 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 fixing and confectioning uh, clothes clothes that will be uh, uh, both by the by the by the industry and that and that and she makes she sew that with the own ener energy that she uh, fights for and she pays it and she pays the water and she pays the services and she built and she bought that sewing machine so she's putting all the all the components of the capital in there the capital just put nothing in there but in the other hand she also takes care for their own children and the rest of the community children And she also put a lot of work in the organization of the community. She organized the rest and she organized in order to guarantee the water, in order to guarantee the health, in order to guarantee the education. She's a spoker person in the communal council. So what I'm trying to say is that we have a lot of work which is unrecognized And we have the challenge to recognize all that work and all the value that it generates because it's it's below the radar. And we need to start to uh, recognizing it. But there's a discussion over here in the South, especially in Argentina, about the necessity to, to, to establish a, a, an universal payment for that job, for that work. And, and I don't disagree. I think that's important, but it's not the only thing. I think that this recognition of value is not just about a salary for that value. I think that we need to recognize that this value has to take political control of society, political control of economy, because it's actually the work that is moving the whole society. And in that sense, I want to say uh, that related to this uh, Titian uh, mention of comparative studies, I think it's quite important to start a process of, of seeing the contribution of all this work, of all this value generation that makes all these women in rural and and also urban communities because uh, we need to start um, studying the whole uh, chains of value for life that we are that we need to protect and that we need to strengthen right now uh, also say that yes that maybe could be part of the internal contradictions that we have now I think that it's quite important uh, for the different uh, uh, left activists right now to start a process of discussion about internal contradictions because there is some left uh, sectors that kind of think that if there is contradiction, there is no revolution. And I actually think that it's the opposite of that. There is no revolution without contradictions. And we need to uh, embrace that, and we need to fight for that, and we, not, we need to study that, and not put aside of it. We need to guarantee our support. We support Cuba, and we love Cuba, and we know that they have a lot of contradictions, as well as Venezuela. But we have to embrace our comrades in fight and struggles. And I think that actually that's quite important regarding to what David mentioned about, uh, about uh, the campaigns against Venezuela. I, I think that we need to uh, reunite all the ones that are 
victims of campaigns against, because China is also victim of campaigns from United States, not only from the United States, from the Western. And we need to recognize that. I can be, I can have differences with some uh, Putin's Russian decision, or maybe with some Iran's decision, with China's decision, but at the end of the day, we are the rest against the West, and we need to reunite in that, in that essence. I think that's quite important also for the comparative studies. We need to establish comparative studies between the global South in order to promote our own project. The, the linking project needs to have comparative studies like a, like a common ground. And, and in that sense, we need to build, and, uh, and that's the reason I always congratulate this South-South Forum initiative, because it's as an instance to dialogue directly, not intermediated by the, by, the, by the mainstream. We need to establish this direct dialogue between us in order to see each other. And we need to defeat this uh, Western colonized uh, point of view that put us like, a, like an intermediate. I think that Rossi is right when she said, we need to, to start uh, learning Portuguese. We need to start uh, learning. We need to start learning between us because it's not possible that we need to, that, that I communicate right now in English. I should be able to communicate in Butowa or even in Portuguese. Uh, well, th there's a lot of things to say. I, I just want to um, mention for, for closure that uh, at this point, I think we have a, a process of winds of hope in Latin America. Not winds of hope without contradiction, with a lot of contradiction. Colombia's Petros will have a lot of difficulties, a lot of them. But we need to support Petro and we need to reunite. We need to establish unity. But knowing that they will have a lot of contradictions, they will have a lot of difficulties to change this, this colonial framework that they have been uh, imposed. And also in Brazil, I think it's quite important to uh, uh, take off to defeat uh, Uribe the ultra left, uh, ultra right government in Colombia is quite important. But also to defeat Bolsonaro in Brazil is quite important. But not, not, don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean that we have the revolution. We have to fight for the conditions too. Uh, I think that uh, building economies for life is actually a big challenge in order to, to, to build uh, some mixture models. We won't have uh, communal economies or economy-centered alternatives, centered in life uh, without capital. Probably we will have to establish a relation, maybe like Bolivia. Bolivia proposed this idea that they say that, that we have an economy where you have private economy, private sector economy, and a state center economy, and a community center economy. And there's where I think it's quite important this mentioned by, by David about this communal process. I think that we need to, to have communal, in these comparative studies, Titian, the communal issue, it's a key element to, to discuss. And, and, and at the end, I wanna say, this communal economy, I think that maybe contributes to decrease the inflation. Also, this communal economy contributes to guarantee another point of things that the macroeconomy is not regarding. You know, the communal economy not only decreased the inflation, it has another patterns that we are not studying, that we are not measuring. And I think that we need to, to embrace the challenge of make that study together, brother. Thank you very much. I totally agree with Aaron and 
many discussions that the South global South countries should reunite more and make more comparative studies so that they can learn and draw lessons from each other because of our limited time. Then they will go on and pose some of the questions from Chinese audiences. On another platform, Xiaotong, where we're live streaming, there are more than 400 audiences and they posed a lot of questions. The first question is posed to her. It says that you've emphasized on the communes in Venezuela and their the assets that they own, where the ownership is neither private nor state owned nor public. So what's the difference between all these? So what if what what if the communist interest comes into conflict with national interest? How to make the efficient and appropriate decision eventually? Three more questions about commune the food production of communes in Venezuela. Would you tell us more about food self-sufficiency in Venezuela and how to encourage you participate in production of food? So this is the second question. And a, one other related question is, how to promote the solidarity and mutual assistance culture among communes? What are the challenges and like good experiences? Thank you. Maybe we'll start with these questions first. I think that maybe not necessarily you always have a conflict of interest. Not all the time, but you will have it when you talk, we hear talk and Hugo Chavez talk about the social property regime, which is a communal property. Maybe uh, quite similar to the, to the land regime in the rural side in, in, in China. But in here, we also have um, a social property means of production. And we are actually discussing what are, what are the odds in this case. For example, at this point, uh, we start in the last time we have been discussing with some banks in here in Venezuela and, and, and a commune goes there, uh, a coffee productive uh, commune and goes to the bank and says, I want a credit. I want, I want, a, I want a loan from you, and the and the bank says, well, which which one is your your guarantee? If I give you money, what will you, what will give me a guarantee if you don't turn the money back? And it has been an, an interesting discussion because we said I I can put the property of this in guarantee. I can't because this belongs to all of us. So. If we don't pay you, if that happens, you can't take the land from us because it belongs to all of us. It belongs to our children and our and our grandchildren. And this has been a, an interesting discussion because at this moment we have to we are discussing about the necessity to think in another financial system that thinks that our own the their patrimony. Their, their, their state is not uh, the private state. We need to build a financial system that actually promote social property state, where you say, if you, if, you, if you give credit, if you give a loan for building a social mean for production, you are investing in the communal, in the communal state. And that, that needs to build different logics, different paradigms, parad paradigms for, for banking, for finance. But this is an ongoing discussion that we have here. 
Our food self-sufficiency in Venezuela is related to the, to the change in our consumption patterns. Because for example, one of the most uh, common uh, food uh, commodities in Venezuela is the wheat center bread or the wheat center uh, 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 pasta, uh, noodles. Uh, the wheat noodles, but actually in here in Venezuela, we don't produce any wheat. So we are uh, basically dependent of a, of, a, of, a grow, of a crop that is produced in another countries. And I think that actually is related to the recent uh, agreement between the UN and the Ukraine and Russia, because the dependency in some crops uh, determines the geopolitical relation, relations. So in the last years of crisis, it has represented an opportunity to change the pattern of consumption. During some years, we believe that here in Venezuela, we don't produce what we need. But the crisis has demonstrated that actually we don't, we don't, uh, we don't consume what we produce, you know? And that's something that we need to change. We need to start consuming eating what we produce because the dependence pattern has put us in a situation where we don't eat that we produce and we need to import the things that we consume. That's a colonial pattern that has been imposed in our, in our country. And also it's related to the, to the, to the participation in the production of food. The last year of crisis has increased the capacity of production uh, in the family production, but also related to the, to the studies. We are here right now trying to, to build studies to establish uh, the rate of the internal consumption that comes from the family production because we, we don't know at this, at this time, we don't know that, we don't have that information. And that actually is related to the issue that we mentioned before by Rossi, which is how, and also by, by, by Conrad Bandana Shiva, which is the systematical destruction of knowledge is a, a, a process that has put us in this situation where we don't study the production from below. And that's something that we that we that we are trying to face right now. Uh, as I mentioned before, at this point, I'm, I'm I'm vice minister from communal economy, and one of the things that we are building now is studies in order to measure the 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 size of the communal economies. I hope that for the end of the year, I could bring you some figures, some numbers about it. Uh, uh, well, and the, la and the last issue, in the last times, in the last years in Venezuela, there have been an uh, in interesting process of building alliances between the rural and the, between the countryside and the cities. For example, we have here what we call Pueblo a Pueblo, people to people systems that has been building where you have some farmers, organized in the, some peasants organized in the north, we, north uh, west of the country that are bringing their products to the cities, to the urban communes that are organized without intermediation, without intermediaries. And, that, and that's quite, quite interesting to see, but also you have these kind of, of examples like uh, the place that you visited uh, two years ago, Tishan, which was in Sokopo, where you have this communal market, which is uh, between the, the urban area and the, and, the, and the family producers, 
where they put their production to exchange directly to the urban commoners. And like that, we have a lot of examples in the last time we are promoting at this moment what I can say from, from, the, from my responsibility as vice minister, we are promoting at this time what we call communal economy circuits, where we are promoting, where, where we are promoting the building of chains of value from below, which means we are promoting the articulation, building an alliance between a, a small producers of coffee in order to promote a circuit that they control by their own. And they control the, pro, the, the, the transformation of the, of, the, of the grain and also the trade market of the, of, the tra of, the, of the grain. So we're building a cycle of production where they can, can have control of it. And they have social uh, ways of property for, those, for that circuit, for that communal economy, common economy circuit. That is ex ex uh, actually what, what we are being building in the last time. Uh, yeah, that could be my comments. And actually, I can also uh, make some make some um, contribution to the question because when the in when when I was visiting the uh, Venezuela. I met some young people. They were also uh, involved in some uh, social movements, but now they started to study how to grow, how to cultivate in the in the rural areas, in the communes. So I would like to say that you don't have to always rely on the outer environment. You don't need the 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 push from the outside for those people they are more like motivated by their own by by their own concerns by their own consciousness about that the need to the need to participate in the production not instead of just always involving in the social uh, movement so now it's already late very late but at nine it's already more than later than 11 o'clock at night so now that i have a last question to uh Hernan and rosie so Rosie mentioned Paulo Freire. Freire also has many books available in Chinese translation. So would you to Rosie and Hernan Vargas tell us if his ideas are practiced in Venezuela? So maybe the two of you can give a, a short comment. Thank you. Well, I live in Mexico. And I haven't been to Venezuela. I have to go to Venezuela, actually. We're close. You are more than invited, more than welcome. Well, the uh, Paulo Freire's ideas and contributions are part in our in practice in our territories in America, in Brazil, in Cuba. We I think we all do that. We try to put it into practice at school. And something that we have said, and how can we put this into practice in our territories? Well, I remembered uh, an interview of Esther Perez to so, Paulo Freire on the um, curricula and uh, revolutionary education. And he said that when, whenever we are in a revolution, what is important is to change that curricula that was useful to some kind of society and that we'll have to uh, build new curricula. Um, and we have to do this with happiness, but also with responsibility. So that is what we are doing here. We are underlying hope, happiness, and above all commitment to build whatever we want knowing that in the way we will have many contradictions that we can overcome them collectively. And yes, we put it into practice because we want to have a different education. We want to have different uh, relations that are constructive, that are cons that are uh, happy as well. Thank you. Thank you, Hernan, as well. Thanks to Rossi. Thanks for everyone. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, what I want to say is that 
uh, of course, Paulo Freire is a reference for all of us. Uh, I actually think that maybe uh, Paulo Freire is one of the most influential uh, uh, characters in the politics of the last uh, 50 years in the whole region. Not only in the popular education, I think that in the politics, in, in the general matter. I, I remember that, for example, in 2007, Hugo Chavez mentioned the necessity of, of some uh, main engines in order to transform the society. And one of the engines that he mentioned was about popular education. And the other one was about people's power. And the other one was about uh, uh, communal economy. Uh, and all these engines, when, we, when you think about them, actually were related to, to most of the, of the, the tradition of, of Freire, because the necessity to rethinking the world uh, in the way of the oppress against the, against the oppressor is actually a, a common ground for, for, for most of the different uh, 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 currents and trends in, in the left. Uh, yeah, probably, actually, most of the different sectors of kind of left that you can see in the in the continent, all of them will subscribe uh, Paulo Freire's uh, conceptions. Uh, and in that sense, I want to mention that maybe in the in the ways of putting it on practice and related to some issues that I didn't mention before. We have embraced the necessity to start a process of a cycle of always being uh, uh, analyzing, uh, making diagnosis of reality, thinking about it, and, and defining uh, actions, concrete actions, in order to transform that, and always uh, make evaluation of that of that things that we do, uh, in order to go again in the diagnose and practice. In here in Venezuela, they call, they call it a communal cycle, which means that you always are uh, in a process of diagnosis in order to establish some plan of action, in order to uh, programming in collective and then evaluating in collective and then going on again. And I wanna mention that in that process, for example, in the last years, uh, in this process of land reform, uh, the, 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 the comrades from the, from the institute that uh, uh, organized the process of regularization of land for peasants have made a study. They mentioned the, this study before and they told me, this study reflects that most of the times when we register a title of property of the land, uh, uh, the families uh, delegates in the men the, the property of the title. And they also reflect in this study that most of the times when, when they do that, because some other times they, they, they register the title like a family title. But they tell me when we register in the name of the men, of the male, uh, in 90% of the times, this man uh, uh, breaks the relation with the family and build another family. And, they, and he left the, his former family without land. We, in the, in the communal economy, in the, in the communal politics, we have took the decision that there are only two possible ways or three possible ways in order to register uh, land property from now. The first one, of course, is communal property, which belongs to a commune, to a is social property, is collective property. The other one, it's family property. You can register to the whole family, including the children, in order to protect them all. And the third one is uh, the property for the woman, but we said, we won't allow property for the men. 
basically because we need to protect the rights of the woman and the family. We can promote a policy that we already know that uh, has the consequence of, uh, uh, of affection to affect, to inflict, to put in danger the security of women and family. And, that, and I mentioned that because it's, uh, it's related to one of the, of the previous questions, but also we won't be able to define that if we don't have these policies that put in practice this idea of always uh, be in a process of analysis, study, research, uh, of reality in order to transform it. Um, finally, I wanna say that it's, it's been uh, a quite important discussion what we had uh, today. And I will be uh, uh, waiting for more uh, instance for exchange. I think that now that apparently the COVID could be kind of decreasing, we need to start thinking and programming some exchanges. We need to go to Mexico, we need to go to China, you need to come to Venezuela, and we need to program uh, uh, some comparative studies, but also with comparative practices and exchange of experiences in our grounds. Thank you very much for everyone.